All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, lovely to see you all this evening at Lib Dem Virtual uh, Spring Conference. Uh, welcome to the Lib Dem History Group um, Fringe Meeting. I'm Wendy Chamberlain, MP for North East Fife, and I'm delighted to be chairing this evening. Um, the 1920s were a challenging decade for the Liberal Party. Uh, with the advance of Labour, the Liberals were now third force in British politics, and the Asquith and Lloyd George factions united to contest the 1923 general election as one party, but tensions remained. The election resulted in a hung parliament, with the Liberals holding the balance of power. Uh, they opted to sustain Ramsay MacDonald's minority Labour government, but the party remained divided over that decision. Um, when the Labour government fell the following year and the Conservative Party won a landslide victory in the ensuing general election, the Liberals suffered heavy losses. And after the 1929 general election, Macdonald formed another minority Labour government, supported once more by the Liberal Party, which yet again led to division and dissent among Liberal factions. So um, not the happiest uh, period of our Liberal history, but looking forward to the discussion this evening with our speakers, Michael Meadowcroft and Professor Philip Williamson. Um, I'm going to um, come to uh, Professor Williamson first. He is a Professor of Modern British History at the University of Durham. He is a historian of 20th century British politics and aspects of religion and the monarchy in Britain and the British Empire since the 16th century. His publications on interwar British politics, political culture and government range across the Labour, Liberal and Conservative parties, trade unions, big business and financial, economic and imperial policies. I'm delighted to have Professor Williamson with us this evening and invite him to speak. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you very much. I hope you can hear OK. Yes. Um, uh, I, Michael was going to come first, um, but because of technical problems, I'm starting. Um, as it happens, I will begin with some general comments and we'll pass briefly over the 1923-1924 government. There are several general explanations for the Liberal Party's decline from the Edwardian period to the 1930s. The political, economic and social effects of the Great War, the decline of political nonconformity, the split between Asquith and Lloyd George liberals. But none is really sufficient, certainly not as explanations for its extent and character. Liberal recovery of some sort remained possible during the 1920s. And in the early 1930s, liberal politicians returned to ministerial and cabinet posts, including two of the great departments of state. The decisive causes lay rather in the effects of three-party competition in a first-past-the-post electoral system. More precisely, the damage was inflicted by occupation of the balance of power in the House of Commons during 1924 and again from 1929 to 1931. As Michael Bentley showed decades ago, the Liberals of the 1920s regarded themselves as a middle party and had two images of their prospects. One located the party in a triangle with the unionist and labor parties, able to retain significant influence, some power, and even obtain positions in government. The other image placed it between the upper and nether millstones, that is to say, crushed by the other two parties. From 1929 to 1931, the first, establishing a permanent triangle of parties became conceivable, but the second being consigned to the crusher was the longer term reality. The dynamic effects of the party and electoral system caused great difficulties for the smaller party. The advantage and logic for the two larger parties was always to work for the clearest possible polarization as the best means for each to consolidate its own success preserving their own independence and strength while seeking to suppress, even eradicate, the smaller party. These imperatives were especially compelling during the intense political uncertainties of the 1920s, with the dislocation of the earlier party relationships from 1914 to 1923, with the new strength of the labor movement and with the huge extensions of the electorate in 1918, and 1928, including a transformation of its composition with votes for women, all amid severe post-war economic problems and social tensions. The party political system was being remade. Neither the Conservatives nor Labour 
were confident in 1922 or 1929 or even 1931 that they could become enduring parties of government and be able to defend or advance their policies and values. There was a great deal for them to fight for. The general party dynamics were very strong, but they were not inexorable. Liberal collapse to a small and marginal rump from 1935 onwards was not inevitable. Liberal leaders and MPs retained some agency, yet they contributed to, eventually accelerated, the party's decline by being unable to sustain the discipline, collective pragmatism and tact tactical dexterity to prevail against the ruthlessness of the Conservative and Labour leaderships. The dynamics were brutally apparent after the indecisive general election of 1923. A reunited Liberal Party held the parliamentary balance of power with a substantial total of 158 MPs. It might conceivably have regained some places in the Alliance government, right. even in formed a Liberal government. But while Liberals savoured the parliamentary arithmetic, Conservative and Labour focused on the electoral logic. Both rejected any cooperation with the Liberal Party and both did their utmost to damage it. Whatever their differences on other matters, Conservatives and Labour operated a tacit anti-liberal alliance. Liberal MPs were manoeuvred into the worst of political worlds, voting against a Conservative government to allow Labour into office, and just nine months later, voting against the Labour government, precipitating another general election. The Liberal leaders annoyed many anti-socialist liberal supporters, then annoyed many progressive, liberal, many progressive liberal supporters. And many other voters now regarded the Liberal Party as the chief cause of political instability. Here was the paradigm of the third party trap, with the two larger parties seizing the political spoils. Conservatives won the election with a huge majority, but Labour had seen had secured its future as a party of government. Both <coughs> the Labour Party, despite a fierce anti-socialist backlash, increased their shares of the national vote. The Liberal Party, the Liberal share of, uh, of the vote collapsed by nearly a half. It was left with just 40 MPs. From this point, preserving the Liberal Party as an effective national political force was a huge task. One possible strategy favoured by followers of Asquith was to persist with traditional liberal policies of peace, free trade, retrenchment and temperance, to retain a pristine independence, to maintain negative opposition to both Conservatives and Labour, and to wait for enough voters to come to their liberal senses. Lloyd George took a different approach. He focused on remaking the party as active, creative, positive. To modernise it by finding new policies that addressed new post-war problems, reconnecting it with large parts of the electorate and trying to ensure that the other two parties could not ignore and crush it. From 1924 to 1928, his political fund financed detailed reports on coal and power, rural and urban land, trade unions and Britain's industrial future. These were intellectually as well as politically impressive and attracted some of the leading minds in economic and social matters, including Keynes and Roundtree. Their effect, if not their content, even impressed Lloyd <clears throat> George's liberal critics. The Asquithians, now gathered in a liberal council faction, could not gain say the momentum that Lloyd George had created once the party won a series of by-elections. Liberals tried once again to act as a united party. Lloyd George spent the modern equivalent of 30 million pounds in trying to revive the Liberal Party. But what were his electoral and political aims? Over 500 Liberal candidates were fielded at the 1929 general election, more than at any election since its greatest victory in 1906. Like almost everyone else, Lloyd George believed that to be plausible with the electorate, 
the party had to seem to be aiming to win a parliamentary majority and to form a government. This was performative, not practical politics. He did not expect to form a Liberal government. He knew that a very high proportion of the candidates would be defeated. Lloyd George's target was around 100 MPs. <clears throat> His immediate aim was to regain the parliamentary balance of power and to avoid the trap of 1924 by having the policies, the solidity, the toughness to make the Liberal Party indispensable to whichever of the two larger parties was willing and able to form or lead a government. Lloyd George did not mind which of the other parties, Conservative or Labour, won the most seats. He was prepared to work with either. Such flexibility, he believed, was the only possible course for Liberal revival and even survival. From 1925 to 1928, he hoped for a progressive alliance with Labour. In early 1929, he made overtures for an anti-social alliance anti-socialist alliance with the Conservatives. In either case, he knew that his elaborate economic policies would be diluted, but he did not really mind this either, because his larger aims lay elsewhere. One was a coalition government to restore Liberals to ministerial office and able to re-establish its reputation for governing competence. But the greatest aim was electoral reform. To secure the Liberal Party's future by ending first-past-the-post elections, making it the persistent holder of the parliamentary balance of power, creating a permanent triangle party in which Liberal leaders would be power and policy brokers. Yet, it was extremely difficult to, dis to disrupt the existing party dynamics. Neither Labour nor the Conservatives would accept a Liberal alliance while they had prospects of winning the next election. In political terms, Lloyd George's famous electoral election programme, We Can Conquer Unemployment, was a reaction to this failure to bring either of the other two parties into negotiation, a propaganda push as a substitute for an electoral deal. But this only intensified the electoral logic by fo focusing Conservative and Labour attacks against the Liberals. Just 59 Liberal MPs were elected, well short of Lloyd George's aim. He succeeded to the extent that no party won an overall majority, and Liberals regained the parliamentary balance of power. But with fewer MPs than during 1924, this could be regarded as only a delay to its decline. Both Conservative and Labour blamed the Liberals for their own failure to win a majority, and refused coalition or alliance with, with them. Both still aimed to suppress the Liberal Party. Nevertheless, politics after the 1929 election did differ from those during 1924 in two respects. First, this time, Labour ministers, now leading the largest parliamentary party, were determined to remain in government for as long as possible to obtain the real achievements that would enable their party to win a clear majority in a future election in office. They offered cross-party initiatives in various policy areas, seeking to avoid dependence on Liberal support alone by also tying in the Conservatives. Of these initiatives, the most vital for Liberals was an all-party committee on electoral reform offered a tantalizing prospect, but it had frustrating effects. The obvious Labour intention was tactical delay, to string the Liberals along and with Conservative support to obstruct any change which would assist their electoral prospects. The second difference from 1924 was the onset of the Great Depression in late 1929. With mounting economic and financial crises, the Labour government faced increased risks of parliamentary and electoral defeat. This shifted the party dynamics to some degree, as the government sought to cling on, working and hoping for economic and political recovery. The Liberal leaders now had increased bargaining power. 
but their assistance had only been wanted in extremity when the government's deteriorating reputation could all too easily become infectious, spreading to the Liberal Party. And even now, the logic of three-party politics remains strong, with Labour leaders trying to retain as much independence as possible and to preserve the aim of eventually securing a majority government at Liberal expense. The government's readiness to cooperate came resentfully, slowly, in fits and starts, offering less than the Liberals wanted, and with repeated setbacks. In March 1930, a basis for an understanding was forced on Labour ministers, who in return for passage of a vital trade union bill, reluctantly agreed to an electoral reform bill, but only with the alternative vote as least damaging to Labour interests, not the proportional representation which Liberals wanted to maximise their prospects. But even that proposal was rejected by the Labour uh, executive, the Labour Party's national executive in May, and dropped by the government. Ministers instead reverted to the cross-party tactic, proposing three-party talks on economic issues. The Conservatives refused, which might have helped the Liberals to advance their radical employment policies. Except that the Labour ministers, with the advantage of civil service ad expertise, concentrated on presenting the Liberal politics as little different from the government's existing policies, given the new financial constraints. Nevertheless, as the economic and political position became still more precarious, in <coughs> order to he secured consultation on the Cabinet's parliamentary programme with a revival of an alternative vote bill. In practice, a loose alliance had been concluded, but one which both sides felt obliged to keep secret from their followers, given their attachment to party independence. This made it easier for Labour ministers to keep slipping away from commitments, even as their political problems accumulated. Lloyd George was engaged in a desperate race to obtain electoral reform before the Labour government collapsed and both parties <coughs> suffered electoral humiliation. It took months of further pressure, disagreement and negotiation before the Labour cabinet was pinned down to actual introduction of the electoral reform bill and the conclusion of a definite agreement. At long last, in March 1931, Lloyd George had cornered the Labour leaders into a progressive alliance. But under the battering of an economic depression, political manoeuvres and civil service criticism, the distinctive liberal economic radicalism of the late 1920s had been smothered. A new campaign for liberal revival that spring was centred on free trade, a reversion to traditional liberal principles. Three-party dynamics from 1923 to 1931 made liberal survival as a substantially electoral force difficult. The problem was magnified by their further effect of those dynamics. Possession of the parliamentary balance of power, which in principle should have been a strength, was in practice debilitating. It created acute issues over strategy and parliamentary tactics, as Liberal MPs sometimes had as many as four possible choices, to vote for a Liberal motion, to vote with the Labour government, to vote with a Conservative government, or to abstain. Preserving party cohesion in these conditions required extraordinary levels of agreement, trust and discipline, which proved to be impossible the party was simply torn apart. This was, in part, this was partly a legacy of the visceral resentments and distrust dating from the party splits of 1916 to 1922. It par, in part, it resulted from the ideological and policy attraction towards or repulsion against the Labour or Conservative parties. In part, it resulted from the appeal of more successful parties for ambitious politicians. The experience of the balance of power during 1924 not only reopened the divisions between Lloyd George and Asquith liberals, it created new divisions between anti-socialist and progressive liberals, leading to defections of MPs or candidates 
either to the Conservatives, most notably Churchill, or to the Labour Party. But the problem of maintaining party discipline was exacerbated by the strategic and tactical difficulties of leadership within three-party politics. Lloyd George felt he had to be prepared to negotiate with, make overtures towards, threaten or flatter the leaders of each of the other two parties to switch from one to the other with the aim of winning concessions that could secure the party's future. If the party was to endure within a party triangle and not be crushed, strict consistency was impossible. Yet this switching back and forth brought suspicion and criticism. The Liberal Party roughly held together from 1929 to uh, late 1930, but at the very point when Lloyd George was securing an alliance with Labour to include electoral reform, the party began to fall apart. In important divisions in the Commons, Liberal MPs voted in four different ways. New factions formed. Some MPs made sought independent arrangements with either Labour ministers or Conservative leaders. And Labour ministers and Conservative leaders, of course, encouraged those divisions as they sought to weaken the Liberal Party. Indeed, an important reason why Labour ministers agreed to an alliance in early 1931 was that they could see that the Liberal Party was splintering. Lloyd George was useful for the time being, for keeping government in office, but his divided party could not be a threat at the next election. The main breakaway faction was led by John Simon, who as early as December 1930 asked for a place in a Conservative government for which he would accept some degree of fiscal protection and drop the issue of electoral reform. By June 1931, British politics seemed to be polarising into a largely two-party system, with most Liberal MPs in alliance with Labour and perhaps a third in alliance with Conservatives. Now, that outcome was postponed. It was postponed by the financial and political crisis of August 1931 and the formation of a so-called national government, a coalition government, which stayed together to fight an election in October. These events had the paradoxical effect of taking Liberals into ministerial office, yet precipitating the effective end of the Liberals as a substantial national party. Lloyd George, absent during the crisis through illness, was left with a small independent group, which ultimately disappeared. Simon became foreign secretary and leader of a group of national Liberals, available to Conservative leaders as counterweights and possible substitutes for the main body of Liberals. During 1932, these official Liberals, the main root of the modern Liberal Democrats, led by Herbert Samuel as Home Secretary, would not accept Conservative insistence on protectionist policies and left the government. They, the official Liberals, were duly crushed between the Conservative-led National Government and the Labour Party at the general election of 1935 hanging on to just 21 seats. Parliamentary politics, where three or more parties work within a first-past-the-post system, is harsh, it's cruel. By its inexorable competitive dynamics, the two largest parties always seek to maximise their own electoral position at the expense of a smaller party or parties, even if, and even while, they are in alliance or coalition with them. Possession of the parliamentary balance of power is especially perilous and corrosive, imposing enormous strains on party cohesion and trust in party leaders. If alliances are achieved, they can make the smaller party the hostage of the larger one. The great prize for Liberals has to be electoral reform. But even if the larger party concedes this in principle, in practice, it will tend to delay and sabotage any reform measure. A secure liberal position requires another party to be somehow persuaded that electoral reform is in its own interest and be pinned down to implementing it. Thanks.
Lovely. Thank you uh, very uh, much, Philip. Um, certainly lots of parallels uh, now to today in terms of still continuing to fight for electoral reform and still, I suppose, dealing with some of the aspects of, uh, of co coalition. Um, oh, for 40 MPs, though, that would be uh, lovely. Thank you very much. I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, Michael uh, Meadowcroft. Hopefully, we'll have uh, you'll be able to successfully join us after uh, uh, issues uh, earlier. Michael, I want to start with an apology. Um, I've just moved office at Westminster, and I'm currently stuck in Fife with COVID. But uh, I was informed by my office this week that in the move, we found a letter that you wrote to me with a newspaper cut from the Yorkshire Post. And we've never responded because we didn't have it. So I'm very <laughs> Sorry for that. But let me introduce uh, Michael. He's one of the party's leading political thinkers, writers and practitioners. He became the Liberal Party's local government officer in 1962. He was a member of Leeds City Council from 1968 to 1983 and a member of West Yorkshire Metropolitan <coughs> County, County Council from 1973 to 76 and from 81 to 83. And finally, he was our MP for Leeds West from 1983 to 1987. Michael. Thank you very much, Wendy, and my apologies for having these lectures in reverse order. For some curious reason, Leeds was cut off audio uh, from from the rest of you. Can I just comment to uh, Philip was saying? Michael, you've just gone on to mute, I think. We can't hear you. That should be you. If you've got the three green dots, that should be you. Mm -hmm. I want it on Yes, mute. you're here. You are unmuted. But sadly, you've gone back on mute again. No. Now you are. You're fine now. I... Yes, you're fine now. Oh, Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And um, the but you've the bottom. It seems as if you're going on and off. Okay, fine. Sure, sure Keep going. <laughs> oh dear, we now seem to have lost them. Wendy, shall I do the um, advert for the group just while we're waiting for Michael to come back? Yeah, OK, that sounds fine. Uh, I'll come to Duncan next then, who's going to say a few words about the Liberal Democrat history book while we try and get uh, Michael back. As well as that, after that excellent uh, initial presentation by Philip, if you do have any questions, do please start putting them into the Q&A. Duncan. Thanks very much, Wendy. And apologies to everyone for the technical problems. Um, those of us who are members of conference committee are really looking forward to getting back to real physical conferences and not having these issues again. Um, so my name is Duncan Brack. That's interesting. So I'm continually being muted by someone as well. So I wonder if that's the Michael's problem. Um, I'll carry on speaking and I'll try and fix it afterwards. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'm editor of the Journal of Liberal History. I just want to say a few words about the Liberal Democrat History Group for those of you who don't know us. Uh, we were founded when this party was set up back in 1988 to promote discussion and research of the histories of the Liberal Democrats and our predecessor party, the Liberal Party and the STP. And we do this in four main ways. First of all, we published the Journal of Liberal History. This is the most recent issue. It's a quarterly. Um, this one came out in January. The next one's due out next month. And we contain a range of um, articles and book reviews and reports of our meetings uh, and other material. Um, you can have a look at the latest issue on our website and you can subscribe there as well. We um, also publish a range of reference books and booklets um, of which the latest book is British Liberal Leaders, a chapter on every Liberal leader up until Nick Clegg in 2015. Um, and we're hoping to produce a new short booklet 
um, on by-elections and their importance in British history, and that will hopefully be uh, British liberal history, and that'll hopefully be available for the autumn conference. Uh, we maintain the website, as I mentioned, at www.liberalhistory.org.uk, and we also organise meetings, of course, uh, like this one. Um, there will be, we generally do a fringe meeting at every Liberal Democrat conference. So again, hopefully the one in the autumn will be online, will be uh, in person. Uh, I hope we'll be able to allow online access to it as well, but that depends on the conference arrangements. Um, and also we organize meetings in between conferences in the summer, either online or in the National Liberal Club in London. And actually the NLC is now quite well set up for um, a hybrid event with people being able to log into it online. So we hope we will be able to do that um, in July and we're still settling on the topic for the, the next meeting in July. Uh, in the autumn, the fringe meeting we hope will be a meeting to accompany the launch of our uh, booklet on by-elections. Um, as I said, you can see all information about us at uh, our website. Um, also, if you'd like to join our mailing list, if you click on the polls tab that you, you should see to the right of this window, you'll see a question that just asks you, would you like to join the mailing list? Um, and if you vote yes, we'll be automatically sent your email address after the meeting and we'll add you to that. We will just use it to give you information about our events and our publications. Uh, we won't give it to anybody else. Um, so hopefully you'll take advantage of that. Uh, I should say, just to finish, subscription to the Journal of Liberal History costs just £25 uh, for four issues a year, £15 unwaged, and that gives you discounts from all our publications, and often we're able to organise discounts about um, on uh, sales of liberal history books from other mainstream publishers as well. So I hope you think we're worth supporting. Um, if any of you would like to get involved in the group and help us run it, um, we do we think quite a lot on quite a small organizing committee that would be great as well if you want to email me afterwards or get in touch that would be great great Thanks very thank much, you Lee. very much duncan i'm sadly not seeing a uh, um michael rejoining which is is very unfortunate hopefully duncan can go and um, make that happen philip could i ask you to potentially um put your camera back on and I think we've already had a question in the Q&A and um, while we wait for Michael it might be useful just to um, move on, on to that um, and that first question is from Ian Sharp um, which was how far was the fact that both Baldwin and Macdonald despised Lord George, uh, Lloyd George and saw him as a malign even corrupting influence in British politics a factor in limiting liberal influence after both the 23 and 29 general elections. I'd be interested in your thoughts on that one. Thank you. And anybody else, please, other questions in the chat. Yeah, ov obviously that was a, a very important aspect. It's, it's particularly um, strong with Baldwin, um, on which there's a very good book written by me. Um, no, I mean, one of Baldwin's principal... Um, claims to public reputation was that he was an honest man um, who put uh, performance before promises. He was, he was against um, a politics of promises. And of course, by this he meant Lloyd George uh, with his great um, <coughs> economic programs of the 1920s. Um, MacDonald, um, I don't think had, that quite, had quite that same moral <coughs> objection um, to Lloyd George. But he, of course, um, had that position of being one of the great founders of his party. He had that um, attachment to the notion of party independence, which, which meant that he was very um, resistant to working with liberals, um, more so than other <coughs> um, Labour leaders like Snowden or Henderson. So, yes, the, the Lloyd George aspect is certainly very important. Um, but it's a kind of um, objection which could be overcome um, if the political um, dynamics, as I've called them, had been different. Um, it is possible for uh, politicians um, who have been daggers drawn to come together, as Asquith and Lloyd George did um, in 19, uh, uh, 1923. So those kind of personal tensions are important and can be very important, but I don't think they're decisive. <coughs> Great, thank you. Um, as the MP for North East Fife, I did chair a, a Liberal Democrat history group meeting um, last year, I think, which was talking about Asquith and Lloyd George. And, and given that my constituency contains East Fife, <laughs> I, did feel yes, a, I did feel a slight loyalty to Asquith. Um, yes. Though I always joke that our uh, 
our, our views on, on universal suffrage may not have aligned, but hopefully he's happy no. to see the constituency back in uh, Liberal um, hands. Thank you very much. Uh, Duncan, are we having any luck with getting Michael back with us? Or uh, others, can I encourage you to put uh, questions in the chat? Technical problems are continuing, but we're trying to resolve them. Sorry. Great, thank you uh, very much. So um, everybody, I've got 58 people currently watching. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, Philip is yours if you have any particular uh, questions uh, for him. Uh, in the meantime, I suppose, uh, Philip, um, you know, does it feel, I suppose, looking back um, to almost a century ago, um, do you feel that potentially history is repeating itself or until we have some degree of electoral reform, are we always going to see these problems from a three party perspective? And indeed, I suppose what we have to acknowledge is the Liberal Democrats are, are currently no longer the third party in British politics, given that the SNP currently yes, sits exactly. as third in the House of Commons. Yes, I mean, multi party politics that we have now obviously complicate mm -hmm. matters even more. Yes, I'm just um, waiting for oh, oh. We have Michael back. Here's a miracle. Let's, can well? Philip, can you hold that <laughs> thought then, just uh, given that uh, we have Michael here and we can hear him. Uh, Michael, I'm going to hand straight over to you and we can come back to that question uh, later. Thank you very much. All right, this is, the whole thing is bizarre, but let's, let's just plow on and see. Uh, in actual fact, I was going to say that the title of this meeting about working with Labour, Liberal Party and the Balance of Power, it would be a very short lecture in terms of the 1923 election and the 1924 Labour government because there is no cooperation with the Liberal Party at all. And so one could uh, stop there. The, the, the received truth about the Labour government of 1924 and the, and the Liberals is that Ramsay MacDonald set out to kill off the Liberal Party and did it by calling an election at the end of the first nine months of the Labour government, which in fact did just that. In fact, the reality is very different. MacDonald certainly didn't intend to have such a short parliament, short government. He intended to belong to show that Labour could govern and that they were a responsible government. And he set out to actually do that. The fact is that it was a total failure of the whips. I suspect that Labour was totally naive about how parliament worked coming into it so fresh. And in actual fact, they didn't understand how that the whips uh, were crucial to the way that Parliament worked, particularly in this three-party system. They didn't understand that they had to cooperate with the Speaker. They didn't co they know they had to cooperate in sorting out the business, nor crucially, in terms of the arithmetic of the Parliament, that they had to ensure that their, the Liberal Party, certainly because the Tories were not going to cooperate, the Liberal Party was actually present to make sure that parliamentary business could continue. The thing was that Labour wasn't even the largest party. It was the second largest party. The Tories were still the largest, Labour second and Liberals third, but with a substantial number of seats. And the thing was then that the, 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 the Labour Party in government would announce things that were going to happen without consulting at all with the Liberals as to whether they would have members there to continue it. And if they didn't have the Liberal members in, present in the chamber, the Tories would simply stop the business continuing. But they didn't understand that. Now, Asquith, uh, as leader, he had the support of Lloyd George. Lloyd George had come into it at the 1923 election and he openly and expressly said he would support Asquith as leader. And he did do that, certainly at the beginning. But the thing was that Asquith had not had a, a competent whip for some years. The whip at the beginning of the, uh, of the uh, uh, coalition, the parliamentary coalition in, in, in the, for the First World War, was a man called Percy Illingworth. And with a name like that, as you might imagine, he was a Yorkshire wool man. But Illingworth was astonishingly competent and he would continue right the way through until in 1916, he had, a, he, he, he had an unfortunate incident and that he ate a bad oyster and died within a fortnight of typhoid. And in a curious way, it was this unfortunate mollusk that caused the downfall of the Liberal Party. It's certainly a unique event. Lloyd George is on record as saying that had, had Illingworth continued in office as, as chief Liberal Whip, the problems between him and Asquith would never have occurred. I don't know whether that's hindsight to have been kind to someone who died in unfortunate circumstances, but that was the case. 
Asquith then went through a whole series of individuals. Uh, so one whip, he then had two whips, he had three whips, and none of them were very satisfactory. And in the end, he appointed, uh, in February 1923, his former secretary, Vivian Phillips, who was the seventh liberal whip in 10 years. Now, Phillips was competent and efficient, but his one problem in the context of what was happening in the Labour government in 1924, that he was absolutely opposed to Lloyd George and wasn't at all enamoured with the fact that Lloyd George was back in the party. And that played a part in what happened thereafter. Labour, on the other hand, had also got a problem with this whip in that the highly competent Arthur Henderson, who was the only Labour MP who had cabinet experience, had lost his seat at the 1923 election. Uh, Henderson had a habit of losing his seat at general elections and winning seats at by-elections. And had he continued in the 23 Parliament as Chief Whip, again, the problems that arose might have actually been dealt with. But he was out of office. And indeed, when he did come back at a by-election, he insisted to MacDonald that he had a great office of state and didn't come back as Chief Whip. So MacDonald appointed a man called Ben Spoor, who had been the MP for Bishop Auckland since 1918. Now, Spoor was a competent for ILP type man and a very pleasant man. He was actually a Methodist local preacher, which in the context of what happened might be odd. But Spoor had two problems in 1923. One was not of his making, in that his war service in the First World War had been in Salonika, where he had contracted malaria. And it was a type of malaria that kept on recurring so that he was missing off ill. But the second problem was that he was rapidly becoming an alcoholic. And there are various comments in diaries of the period um, that, 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 that Spore was present, reeking of whiskey and so on. Beatrice Webb, for instance, comments like that. And so Spore was missing and absent. And so the whole business of Parliament was not being dealt with in any kind of competent way. Various things continued, and in, in many respects, the, the Parliament did go on under its, own, under its own steam. But MacDonald expressly said to Parliament that he would not regard a defeat in the division lobby as necessarily a vote of confidence and a resignation matter. And in actual fact, there were 12 occasions when the government was defeated and MacDonald did not regard it as a resignation matter. And some of them on, for instance, housing matters, were certainly important. Now, the, at the beginning of this parliament, there had been the possibility of Asquith insisting that they voted out both Tories and Labour, in the, so that the, the, uh, <clears throat> he would have to be sent for by the, by the king to see whether he could form a Liberal government. And you could argue that he would have had support from Labour had that been the case. But Asquith expressly turned that down and said that if the Tories were defeated when they presented a, a King's speech, as it happened, then he felt that it was only right that Labour should be given the opportunity to, to come into office. And there was the problem. <clears throat> but MacDonald was, was also foolish in that he was also his own foreign secretary. So that not only was he under pressure as the prime minister in the minority government, but he was also absent a lot, trying to deal with the foreign secretary's duties. His deputy was Klein, Jimmy Klein, and he was pretty hopeless. Only Klein thought that he was competent, and yet he had to deputize for MacDonald in the house on many occasions. Eventually it came to the situation that uh, <clears throat> It was said by, um, by the, in the Times newspaper, the whips room has been heavily handicapped in this session by the continuous absences of Mr. Ben Spore, the chief government whip, and by the breakdown in health of two other whips. But it has been obvious to those who have been watching events that the whips have exercised little influence over the rank and file. It is very much the case that that even had Spore been present and continued, the problems that occurred later would not have been any different. Labour also behaved badly in that they were supposed to be relying on the Liberals to continue the government, and yet they were adopting candidates in seats 
where the Liberals were hoping to uh, gain seats, but they were not able to do it if Labour split the vote. And yet all the time, Liberals were stuck in Parliament, trying desperately to keep this uh, government going without any help from the, from the Labour Party itself. Meanwhile, Labour was adopting candidates, and there were a certain number of, there was a particular by-election in Oxford, where it caused the loss of a Liberal seat. This infuriated the Liberals in Parliament. And when it came to the Easter recess, the party decided that it would go back to its constituencies and ask them what they thought they should do. And they <clears throat> then, then there was a famous speech by Lloyd George at the time, when he, with one of his obvious, very typical, florid statements, Lloyd George said at the Easter recess in 1924, Labour says that liberalism is in the way. It has to be killed. There won't be an election for two or three years, so we are allowed to live for a little longer. We must best make the best use if, of our time, and meanwhile we must help Labour. Liberals, he said, are to be the oxen to drag Labour over the rough roads of Parliament for two or three years. And at the end of the journey, when there is no further use to them, they are to be slaughtered. That is the Labour idea of cooperation. Then came a key debate, and Asquith had put forward that what the party's uh, policy should be. But the, unfortunately, although, although Lloyd George had been opposed to the policy, he accepted that the party was going to be opposed to it, and he then decided he would support that. However, he would not be present in the chamber, he said, because he had a, a dinner engagement that evening. The party was a guest, because here was quite clear evidence of a split in the party. And <clears throat> Vivian Phillips, the Liberal Whip, was sent to go after Lloyd George to try and persuade him. Phillips comments in his own memoirs that Lloyd George was frankness itself. He did not want to go against the party, but as for actually voting with the government, that was more than he could stand nothing would induce him to do it. And as Phillips comments, this was the beginning of a feeling of distrust and suspicion, which was a continuing source of difficulty in our work during the remainder of the session. At the time, the Liberal Party was in, in, in serious difficulties with its leadership. I, I happened to by chance to be <clears throat> reading the diaries of Leo Amray, a senior Conservative Member of Parliament at the time looking through that particular period. And there's a rather amazing little entry in Amory's diaries. Amory says that in May 1924, in the afternoon, I went for a walk with Hudson. Now, Robert Hudson was the, the great Liberal apparatchik. He had been at Liberal Party headquarters since 1893 and was trusted on all sides. So he said, I went for a walk with Hudson, who was most entertaining on the subject of his unsuccessful efforts to get Lloyd George to disgorge his private Liberal coalition funds into the common Liberal purse. In his view, the only satisfactory solution of the problems of Liberal leadership is for a railway accident to deprive the party of Asquith, Lloyd George and Simon simultaneously and leave them with Donald McLean, whom they all trust and like. That, according to the Liberal headquarters, the Liberal staff, was the, the, how difficult the situation was. Now, it is often said that the, the government fell, and it was the Liberals who caused it, over the Russian treaty. There was a whole effort to be friendly with Russia and to have a treaty with Russia and to put uh, guarantees of funding into, into the Russian government. And in fact, McDonald was, was traveling to ensure that happened. But that is not the case over the final fall of the Labour government. For instance, the 1923 Liberal Manifesto stated clearly, we would welcome the reopening of full relations with Russia. And this wording gave ample room to manoeuvre. Even so, it was not even the loan to Russia itself, which would have brought into party difficulties, but only the government's guaranteeing of it. As it happens, the substantive issue of the Russian loan never arose, but there was a comedy of errors ensued whose momentum none of the key players seemed able to arrest and which finally destroyed the first Labour government. Labour's Attorney General was Sir Patrick Hastings. 
He was an eminent lawyer, but certainly not an experienced North Sami politician. I might comment incidentally that one of the difficulties was with these brand new Labour MPs and ministers, that they relied a lot for their knowledge of what how Parliament worked on people like Hastings and indeed on Haldane, who were rather pompous with their attitude to Labour and Labour resented it, just as they resented Asquith's rather imperious attitude. And the events <clears throat> themselves that which caused the downfall are convoluted, but they can be summarised for the sake of focusing on their impact on the government's frailty. The editor, an acting editor that turned out of a Communist Party weekly paper called the Workers Weekly, was one John Campbell. And he wrote a front page editorial urging British soldiers not to shoot fellow workers. Sir Patrick Hastings, as the government's chief law officer, gave his opinion that this was seditious and treasonable. The Director of Public Prosecutions, therefore, decided to prosecute Campbell under an ancient law, the Incitement to Mutiny Act of 1797. Patrick Hastings had no sense of the political furore that would follow from his action. To the government's horror, it was soon publicised that not only was Campbell only a standing editor, but he also was a decorated First World War veteran who had been grievously injured in both feet. It didn't take much in the way of representation from MacDonald and others in the government for Sir Patrick gracefully to withdraw the prosecution. This was, of course, naive and that it left him open to accusations that there had been political, process, political pressure on the legal process, which was, of course, entirely true, even if justified. Then came the fatal error. Foolishly, Ramsay MacDonald told the House that he had not intervened, even though he had, and even though Sir Patrick Hastings volunteered to take full responsibility. A private notice question from the Conservative MP Sir Kingsley was put down which essentially censured the government for its action on the Campbell case. Now, this clearly put the Liberals in a dilemma. The last thing they wanted was an election, and so was a way out. The Liberals put down a fairly bland motion asking for a parliamentary inquiry to examine the facts. The, the Tories saw that opportunity, and they took it. In the course of the debate, the government said, again, foolishly, given that they're only dealing with a procedural matter rather than the substantive issue, that it would regard both motions as issues of confidence. Cleverly, the Tories withdrew their motion and said they would back the Liberals than their proposed committee of inquiry. Now, the Liberals could hardly avoid supporting their own motion, and so they were duly impaled on their own motion. The received truth is that the Liberals had decided to turn the government out. This is the opposite of the case. The Liberals tried every way to prevent it happening. For instance, Asquith made the magnanimous gesture of giving up any Liberal places on the proposed committee of inquiry, but it was of no avail. Now, much is down to MacDonald personally. He was desperately tired from acting as Foreign Secretary as well as Prime Minister, and he preferred not to have the embarrassment of facing the Commons to explain his errors and omissions on the Campbell case. He seems to have fulfilled his statement of the 14th of January that in dealing with any kind of defeat on which the government resigned, said it was impossible to give a precise definition. But he said, I can assure the House of this, and about this there need be no fear that the government will not remain in office five minutes after a division in the House if it is deprived of its dignity. The fact was, as it turned out, that it was MacDonald's dignity that had been impugned, and that apparently was enough. It certainly wasn't the case either that the Labour government was keen to end its own life. Henderson was out of the country, and he was, quote, dismayed at the Prime Minister's sudden decision to throw in his hand. More significantly, the House adjourned after Asquith's speech so that the Cabinet could consider the situation. The Chief Liberal Whip, Vivian Phillips, sets out the sequence of events. The Cabinet conclave went on for about two hours. After it had been sitting for about an hour, I received a message asking me to go round to the Prime Minister's room, where a leading member of the government would be waiting outside to have a word with me. <clears throat> the leading member turned out to be Jimmy Thomas. He told me that the Cabinet was very divided. Did I think everything, anything could be done to avoid that smash? I said that I thought it would be a great mistake to rush at a decision and it would be wiser of everyone to sleep over the matter when it came so that a calmer view of things might prevail. I suggested that the course of action, if it commended itself to the government, that they might, might announce 
to the if they return to the chamber, they propose they ask, they ask the house to adjourn till the following day. Jimmy Thomas appeared to think it's a good idea and asked me, would Asquith agree to such a proposal? I replied that he could accept it as an understanding from me if the government decided to defer the decision to the following day. The Liberals would then raise no objection and I would arrange at once with Asquith for this to happen. When it came to the actual vote, they came back to the House, to the Chamber, and lo and behold, the Cabinet decided not to follow this advice and decided to fight it. Indeed, Jimmy Thomas was put up to denounce the Liberals' proposal for Select Committee and denounced it absolutely forthrightly. So the government fell, and Macdonald's request to the King for dissolution and the fresh election was acceded to. Here lies the end of the Labour government in 1924 because of a lack of any cooperation with Liberals and indeed a failure of the whip system to cope with the exigencies of a three-party split in Parliament and the necessity for cooperation to enable the government's business to carry on. It fell over a stupid procedural matter instead of any substantive issue and of course as we know the 1924 election was a total disaster not only for Liberals but also for the Labour Party. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very uh, much, Michael. We were reflecting earlier after Philip's comments that uh, it feels like a century on uh, some of the some of the same uh, themes. Um, interesting what you said about Labour cooperation or lack of. I'm sure those of us who are in Labour facing seats um, will, will feel that. And uh, I'm quite happy for you always to talk about comp competent chief whips, obviously, as, as Absol well. Absolutely. <laughs> but certainly the power of, of what if came through very strongly in your remarks there. Thank you. Now, I'm conscious, obviously, some of our technical issues means that we've been we're, we're running a bit tight for time. Um, but uh, I'm going to propose that um, we keep the discussion going to 10 to 7 if we're able to do that. Duncan and Neil can tell me otherwise if we can't. But uh, Michael, I... I'm going to come to you first um, in relation to the question that Philip was already answering while we were waiting for you to join or has already answered, which was uh, basically whether the fact that both Baldwin and Macdonald despised Lloyd George um, limited Liberal influence after the 23 and 29 general elections. And then I'll bring Philip back in. Thank you. Mac Macdonald had no problem with Liberals. In all his elections in his constituency of Leicester, he had never been opposed by a Liberal. The Macdonald Glaston Pact of 1903, he concluded to, with, make, to withdraw Labour candidates in a number of seats. I mean, we can take our own view of whether that was a disastrous uh, pact or not, but, but nonetheless, from, from Macdonald's point of view, it worked. Also, he'd been a member of various liberal and liberal labor organizations. The, the Rainbow Circle, for instance, which was a, a dining club which brought together radicals from all parties, he was an active member of, he was secretary for a time, and even addressed it after he'd become prime minister in 1921. So MacDonald had no problem with liberals. Now, I have no doubt that the Labour Party at the time was determined to kill off the liberals, but it was not going to kill it off in the way that it happened. MacDonald wanted to have a, a government which showed it was competent over a number of years, but he was lured into this trap and he couldn't get out of it, having lied to Parliament. Great, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm understanding we might get kicked out at quarter to two, uh, quarter two, but let's just see how it goes. Um, uh, Philip, if, if I can bring you back in, just with that question we asked before Philip, re, uh, Michael rejoined and we got back, is I suppose just that issue around third party politics, but you were reflecting on the fact, as was I, that actually the Liberal Democrats aren't the third party in British politics currently. And I suppose just any reflections on that multi multi party politics that we see now. Thank you. Yeah, as I was saying, it, it makes um, the liberal position more complicated. Um, but I mean, really, the key issue is is whether um, either uh, the Liberal Party itself or in alliance with one of the other smaller parties can find a means of <clears throat> persuading the larger party to uh, that there's sufficient cause for uh, an electoral alliance and preferably in the longer term, um, electoral reform. Um, and the question becomes, <clears throat> what would force the larger party into that kind of position? Uh, and it may be that um, uh, dissatisfaction with uh, a long period of conservative government would suffice to make that kind of arrangement possible. 
um, that um, there's a lot of reasons for the smaller parties to um, dislike um, the Conservative government. The Labour Party certainly uh, dislikes it. Is this the basis for trying to get some movement towards the kind of uh, electoral system which um, secures an appropriate balance of the parties? Yeah. Um, parties can come together. It tends to be, though, at times of real crisis, obviously during the World Wars and in 1931. Mm -hmm. um, will there be another 1931? Things are very... <laughs> Uh, absolutely. And, and and I thought that was quite striking in your comments about the fact that uh, the Liberals were supporting electoral reform because obviously they saw the electoral opportunity for them that ar arose uh, from it. Uh, Michael, is that your view that, uh, that Liberals were supporting electoral reform because it was electorally advantageous for them? Or is there more to about it? Uh, about to it than that, uh, given our current position as a party and the fact that electoral reform has continued to be a theme for us. They were, they were supporting electoral reform whilst they were still a strong party. It wasn't when they became the third party that they started to support it, not at all. Um, there, was, there were efforts way back into the time of First World War and so on to support it as a matter of principle. But it, the, the, the current situation within the Labour Party is very interesting because there is a considerable majority within the constituency Labour parties for electoral reform. It's the trade unions that have been opposing it, and of course their votes are very significant at Labour conference. But what, there is one or two of the big unions that voted against it at the last Labour conference have now changed their minds, and it is conceivable that the next Labour Party conference that, that will vote for a measure of electoral reform. The, the, the next key question is, of course, is what form of electoral reform? One of the terrible weaknesses of the campaign within Parliament, as, as well as outside, for electoral reform, that it's easy enough to say, first past the post is disastrous for this, that and the other reason. But unless you have the alternative ready at hand, then you're in a terribly weak position. And only the Electoral Reform Society, of course, has had an actual alternative. And even the Electoral Reform Society is not putting it forward. And that is, the, that is a huge problem. And I, I, I worked for, elect, for Richard Holmes at National Community Electoral Reform for oh, way back in 1975. And I, the, the weakness that I found then is that I was saying, first past the post is bad. And they said, well, what's the alternative? And you couldn't say. You have to go to people with the, the opposition to first past the post in one hand and the single transferable vote in the other. The difficulty with, with people don't grasp, particularly liberals don't grasp, is that any form of list system is worse than first past the post because it entrenches the power to elect MPs in the selectorate of the party. It entrenches the party machine. So if, if you had like momentum with a dominant force in the Labour Party, deselection in individual, individual constituencies would have been trivial compared to having a list. So the list systems are bad, and I would vote for first past the post rather than them. But the single transferable vote, which gives people a real choice and lets them make their own list, is the only alternative which is worth having. And yet we don't actually get that put forward sufficiently. And it is possible to, to argue with Labour MPs that they are popular, they will do well under SCV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Th thank you very much. I suppose I'm sitting here in Scotland where um, I sit under three electoral systems. I was elected under First Past the Post. Um, we have an additional member system for Holyrood and actually STV, uh, all our council elections in May are under STV. And uh, I suppose in some ways that is a way of putting it forward that we can demonstrate that it works. Very conscious that we are over time and um, I am seeing... Is this one final question? Um, so, uh, Nigel, when did the... So this is a very quick one. Maybe it might be Mike. I'll come to Philip if you've got this. Um, when did the Liberal Party first ever uh, support electoral reform? Did Gladstone ever do so? Um, Phil, Philip, are you aware of that? Or will I return to Michael? Uh, there was certainly um, electoral reform in the sense of um, an alternative to uh, first past the post. Uh, there's certainly Liberal support from that from um, the late 19th century. Um, what seems to have been decisive in um, that not going forward during the electoral um, um, committee uh, in 1917-1918 uh, 1918 was actually Lloyd George was persuaded, um, presumably under conservative pressure, that um, getting any kind of electoral reform was going to be so difficult that having 
um, a change in the voting system was, was just going to be too difficult. So Lloyd George did not press at a crucial moment for um, a change in the first past the post system. Um, okay. Yep. Thank you. Michael, no. anything to add to that before I bring only, this question to a close? Philip says it, there was a move towards it very early on, but it was for an alternative vote, alas, rather than anything yeah. substantial. The only, the only other time we might have had it was Tony Blair's promise to Paddy Ashdown that the, the commission set up under the chairmanship of Roy Jenkins, he said he would implement its findings. What Roy did, and I think it was the fatal political error, was to suggest an even different new system of, uh, you know, the second vote and so on. And then the Labour Party had the excuse, that, oh, well, it's a new system altogether. We have to consider it and so mm -hmm. on. And therefore it fell by the wayside. Roy said to me that he, he didn't think the electorate could cope with less TV and therefore he wasn't going to recommend it, which is a terribly elitist thought. But that was, <laughs> that was the last time it failed. Great. Thank you. I've let it run that five minutes. We haven't been kicked out. Nigel, I see your other question about the Netherlands open list. It sounds like you need to join the other fringe that I'm chairing tomorrow, which is the Lib Dem for electoral reform uh, fringe, where you can ask that question and uh, the panellists there can respond. Um, thank you very much both to our speakers this evening, uh, Professor Philip Williamson and Michael Meadowcroft. Uh, thank you for all of you who are still on the, uh, who are still with us for your perseverance this evening. I think what, although it took a little bit of time, I think what we had was a very comprehensive look at what was obviously a very difficult period in Liberal history. And I'll certainly be going away and reflecting on what I can uh, take from that as, uh, as a Liberal a politician, Liberal Democrat politician with uh, amongst a party of 13 MPs still looking for electoral reform. Thank you to Duncan and Neil for helping me organise as well and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.